thank and to shake the hands and give his support to those thousands of New York police and firefighters working in the recovery effort tirelessly and also to lead the nation in a day of remembrance and a day of prayer. Jonathan. Major, so the president will be traveling again. Let me ask you about his travels on Tuesday. You were with the press corps that was accompanying the president. What was it like that day? It's an amazing day, Jonathan, an amazing day that began in the most ordinary of ways. The president woke up early. He went for a jog, even brought some reporters along. The president likes to jog. He runs at a pretty quick pace, about 7 minutes, 15 seconds per mile. He ran three miles, came back very rested, very fit, feeling very good, even joked with reporters about how good it was to start the morning with a brisk and refreshing jog. Then we were all taken to Emma E. Booker Elementary School in Sarasota, where the president was going to begin reading a book to some of the students arrayed around him. Then he was going to make some remarks about education reform, a top domestic agenda item. But all of that was shattered by the first attack on the World Trade Tower Center, Tower Number 1. The president was notified of that just before he went in to read that book to the school children. And then as he was reading, his chief of staff, Andrew Card, came in, whispered in his ear the dreadful news about the second jet airliner crashing into Tower Number 2. The president's face darkened. Reporters asked him if he had known about any of this news, he cautioned them to be quiet. We would talk about it later, he said, clearly trying to protect the children from the devastating news they and the rest of America were beginning to see unfold before their very eyes. The president then quickly put together a statement telling the nation of an apparent terrorist attack. Then he was whisked away from Sarasota. We were told he was heading back to Washington, D.C., but as we know now, he himself and Air Force One was indeed a target which forced him to fly first to Barksdale Air Force Base outside of Shreveport, Louisiana, then to Offutt Air Force Base near Omaha before returning to Washington. Jonathan. Major Garrett, thanks very much. In the days since the attacks, Pakistan has come under immense pressure from the Bush administration to cooperate with the search for the perpetrators. The country is one of only three that recognize the Taliban regime in Afghanistan, where suspect Osama bin Laden is believed to be based. Tom Mentir joins us now live from Islamabad with the latest there. Tom? John, because Pakistan is one of those three countries that do indeed uh, recognize the Taliban, it is the location of a Taliban embassy. Uh, the embassy is in here in Islamabad, and within the past hour, there was a press conference, a message coming outside of Afghanistan from Mullah Omar uh, to the rest of the world, and it was read out by... Uh, the Taliban's ambassador here to Pakistan. Uh, it was basically denial, denial, denial. A denial that Osama bin Laden was responsible for what happened in the United States. Denial that pilots were coming from Afghanistan that were capable of doing what was done. And denial that Osama bin Laden has the means to conduct such a sophisticated operation. Uh, they went on to say that if the United States uh, acts without evidence that they are committing terrorism themselves, a reference to the possibility of some kind of military action against them. But they say they have taken away the phone, the fax, the email, the access to visitors of Osama bin Laden. Basically, he has been isolated within Afghanistan. Uh, he is basically uh, under house arrest, if you will. Uh, he is basically held incommunicado, not allowed to communicate with the outside, controlled by the Taliban. That is, if you believe what they say, that they are controlling his movements, his meetings, his ability to communicate. They say they've taken away his satellite phone, his cell phone, his internet, his computers, uh, basically holding him in isolation. Now, they have said in the past that if there is sufficient evidence provided that they would put Osama bin Laden up before an Islamic court, the Islamic Supreme Court in Afghanistan, uh, no word about any possible extradition. But basically, the statement coming out of the Taliban today Day was denial of involvement, saying that the United States doesn't have evidence because uh, they know and, and control Osama bin Laden's movements and his activities inside Afghanistan. So uh, it's really not really something new, but a reiteration of their previous position uh, that we've been hearing here in Islamabad for the past couple of days, that Osama bin Laden, in their minds, was not the suspect that the United States sees him as being. John? They seem to be making an important point, Tom, and I'd like to ask you to, to be absolutely clear on this. Are they telling us that Osama bin Laden is actually a prisoner of theirs now in Afghanistan? And if he's done nothing wrong, why would that be the case? 
Well, you have to take their statement on faith, first of all. Uh, they don't use the word prisoner, they don't use the word house arrest, but when you take away people's ability to communicate, to move around freely, to have visitors, uh, and, and control all of that access, you can translate that to, to a prisoner or house arrest or whatever you want to call it. But in fact, they have been controlling for some time now the access in to meet with him, the ability for him to communicate, the ability for communications to come in. Now, in this statement uh, from Mullah Omar, they also said that they don't have the facilities to train pilots in Afghanistan. There, there's no ability to do that. The pilots, they say, did not come from Afghanistan, so they don't have any evidence, uh, according to the Taliban, that the United States can pinpoint and direct the investigation towards Osama bin Laden. They say that his reputation is what they're really taking into account here, not the acts that were committed. Jonathan? John Mintier, thanks very much. Relita? A three-minute silence will be held across Europe Friday. That's scheduled to begin in just about three hours from now. Britain has already said that as many as 100 of its citizens may have perished in the World Trade Center. Germany and Ireland are also reporting losses. European political editor Robin Oakley joins us now from London with more on how events in the U.S. are being viewed internationally. Robin. Relitza, well, there's been a huge outpouring of grief and sympathy across Europe. And first of all, it is at the most basic of human levels. I went down yesterday to Grosvenor Square, where in front of the U.S. Embassy, beneath the statue of Theodore Roosevelt, people have been pouring in to offer bouquets of flowers. They've put down dollar bills. There are candles burning, uh, baseball caps. Uh, there was a picture of Brooklyn Bridge, all sorts of mementos in a, a huge outpouring of public sympathy. But that's been reflected, too, on a much more formal level. At Buckingham Palace yesterday, the Queen specially ordered that for the first time ever the honoured ceremony of the changing of the guard should be altered with the American national anthem being played before God save the Queen. And today the British Parliament is having an emergency session with a statement from Tony Blair who's promised to stand shoulder to shoulder with the US. And it's the same across Europe. There have been church services in many capitals across Europe. There has been a vigil in Moscow at the Frankfurt uh, Motor Show. There was a five-minute silence there. And all this outpouring of public sympathy is being reflected in very strong language of solidarity from the politicians. Robin, what kind of support is Europe considering at this point? Is it considering military support? Yes, I spoke yesterday, Relitza, to the British Foreign Secretary, Jack Straw, and I questioned him directly on this. I said, does this standing shoulder to shoulder mean simply moral support or is it military support? He was absolutely clear. NATO is making it absolutely clear. They've invoked Article 5 of the NATO Constitution, saying that what happened in New York and at the Pentagon is conceived as an attack on all 19 NATO members. Uh, there is going to be considerable discussion about what level of response they would like to see from the United States. There are worries, it has to be said in some countries, about just how high that level should be. Uh, Jack Straw was saying that it is important, too, that any targeted action is targeted on the right suspects. I think there are worries from parliamentarians in some countries that over indiscriminate action, perhaps with women and children suffering, might only cause the outbreak of further terrorism. So they want the, uh, the action to be strictly targeted. And uh, the words that were used on a British uh, radio station this morning of Henry Kissinger, cool, relentless pursuit, were echoed by a number of British parliamentarians immediately afterwards. That's the kind of reaction they want to see. Relitza. Robin, thank you. John. We'd like to take a moment to correct a report that appeared on CNN earlier. Based on information from multiple law enforcement sources, CNN reported that Adnan Bukhari and a brother, Amir, of Vero Beach, Florida, were suspected to be two of the pilots who crashed planes into the World Trade Center. Now CNN has learned that Adnan Bukhari is still in Florida, where he was questioned yesterday by the FBI. We are sorry for the misinformation. Through his attorney, Bukhari says he is not connected at all with this, that he is helping authorities, that any documents they found with his name mean his identity was stolen. He says Amir Bukhari, who he says is not his brother, died in a small plane crash last year. 
German police are investigating a possible connection with the hijackings. They searched four apartments in Hamburg, including the former home of one of the men suspected by U.S. authorities, Mohammed Atta. Atta and another suspect are believed to have received flight training in Florida. CNN's John Zarella has been looking into that. Unfortunately, sadly enough, Henry George feels pain, extreme frustration, and great regret. I don't want to believe that what I did uh, made him successful. Last December 29th and 30th at his Opelaka Flight Training School, George gave two Middle Eastern men some basic lessons in a simulator on how to fly a jet aircraft. The two men were Mohammed Atta and Marwan al Shari. The FBI is now combing through apartments in South Florida, checking cars and mailboxes, all linked to Mohammed Atta. Law enforcement sources say Atta is a suspect in the attack, perhaps a pilot of one of the doomed jets. He was listed on the manifest of American Airlines Flight 11 from Boston. Marwan al Shari, according to German authorities, was also aboard one of the hijacked planes. The story Ada and Al Shari gave their flight instructor was this. They were on their way home, it, uh, and they wanted the exposure to a jet uh, flying or an introduction to jet flying because they were hoping to get a job with their airline in their country. George says they mentioned Egypt a couple of times, but generally during the two days, they didn't have much to say. No small talk. They were uh, low key individuals. Uh, Maybe even call them shy. It, uh, there wasn't, uh, you know, they were not outspoken, opinionated type people. In all, George says he spent eight hours with the two men. They reserved their lessons with a credit card, but paid in cash, fifteen hundred dollars. George says he wishes something about them had been suspicious. He was using his own name. It, uh, they provide you with credit card numbers. It, uh, you know, there was nothing that you would uh, make you suspect that this individual was anything but above board. George says they were just a couple of student pilots and there was nothing special about their abilities. What I can recollect from my memory is that uh, we mostly did turns it, uh, in a couple of approaches. I don't think we did any more than that. What they didn't do, George says, was practice how to land. John Zarella, CNN, Miami. Some airports across the United States have reopened for business, but passengers are facing some tougher security measures. Now, no knives are allowed, including plastic ones. No curbside or off airport check in. Only ticketed passengers are allowed past metal detectors. Also, security personnel have to meet higher standards, and more federal marshals will be on hand at large airports. Just after the attacks, many international flights scheduled to land in the U.S. were diverted to Canada. Most of those have now been allowed to fly to their original destinations. As Chris Burns reports, the first one arrived to emotional scenes at Los Angeles Airport. <laughs> Sighs and cries of relief. That loved ones on an Alitalia flight from Milan to Los Angeles during the terror attacks weren't hijacked themselves. They were diverted to Calgary, Canada. Nunzia Bologna stayed calm, but her sister on the ground was terrified. But we was scared when we heard the news. So thank you God, everything is okay now. The plane finally made it to Los Angeles International Airport Thursday, the first passenger flight here since the terror attacks. On Tuesday's flight, the passengers only knew they were being diverted until one of them called an operator on her cell phone. Her parents didn't know she switched to a direct flight from a stopover in New York. They were more hysterical because they didn't hear anything until 2 o'clock in the afternoon and they thought I was dead. Passengers say the final trip home from Canada started about midnight, hours waiting to take off after lining up for hours of searches. Through the handbags and there were like every small things they were questioning and they were looking for some weapons, I guess. Squeezing out toothpaste tubes, things like everything, that? Everything, everything, even cameras, even everything yeah. with battery operated. And it ended here about 12 hours later, an ordeal for thousands of passengers on countless diverted flights. Passengers at least grateful they're getting home safely. Chris Burns, CNN, Los Angeles. That is many families in New York City were still looking for their loved ones. Elizabeth Cohen has been speaking to some of them.
I haven't seen the American karma come together like this since the Vietnam War. Everybody feels the same way. Everybody has anger, but everybody has compassion. There is no script for what to say, and there's no script for how to feel. My father was a window washer on Tower 2, the observation deck. He worked the rig outside. He last called us at 9.15 uh, 